<laughs> All right, my friends. Mike Wong here. Today is Sunday, April the 7th in the Gregorian timekeeping system. And we're doing another video about the eclipse. And tomorrow's the eclipse. And I want to talk about it. Um, well, one, it's kind of like a follow up to the last video I did about it. And I want to. I want to add something into the discussion, I suppose, other than all of like what seemingly is talked about the eclipse. Like, I'm seeing these two polarized sort of opinions like, hey, the eclipse is going to come and go. It's nothing. Why are you putting any energy to it? Versus like, oh, the eclipse is coming. Something like uh, major is going to happen. And there's, you know, there's a middle path. Like, I don't think anything like the eclipse is going to come and go. Just like, you know, 2012 came and went, you know, all the things that are hyped up. But um, that doesn't mean that there's not something, you know, worthy of paying attention to or or recognizing as significant in the unfolding of life. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about that, I suppose. Um, and there's some weird stuff going on. So weird stuff going on in the world, all sorts of things. So, um with that, with that being said, let's just jump right into this. So, let's begin with this. Like, always go back to the foundation. This experience that you're having, that I'm having, our life experience, being alive, connected to a body, it's a friggin' mystery. You don't know. And the more certain people are that they know, the larger maybe the blind spot is the more likely that they're missing something so we look at experience um and we hold it hold the mystery like we don't know where we are we don't know how we got here we don't understand the greater context of the experience what we can understand though is how this realm works how this experience works we can we can understand that a little bit so <clears throat> Going back to, just because it is a mystery, that doesn't stop people from wanting to solve it or wanting to interpret it. I guess myself included as well. You know, I guess there's nothing wrong with wanting to have some sort of understanding um, into what this experience is or a desire to go and look look at it. I guess the problem, the problem arises when we think that we understand it we're like oh okay i looked at it from a life experience from a religious perspective or a scientific perspective or a metaphysical perspective and this is what it is this is the conclusion like that to me seems to be um maybe where the the error lies but that being said <clears throat> you know one of the um one of the first sort of um, questions or which we're faced with when, when trying to understand the nature of this experience is like, you know, this whole sort of dualism versus holism type of question. So uh, holism looks at everything from uh, the perspective, everything being the experience, the the perspective that there's just one experience which we're all participating in it's where it's one big whole and then dualism is that they're separate experiences and <clears throat> you know it's kind of similar in my opinion to the whole quantum physics wave particle debate is is light a wave or is light a particle and it depends upon how you're looking at it or it can be both and so i think that's kind of true with like holism and dualism like there's certainly a truth to dualism in the fact that you are an individual you're individualized and separate from me and i am from you from a certain degree but then there's another perspective that we're all part of the same totality or holism um there we go. 
Um, so holism and dualism and you know dualism is like the question between the creator and the creation and it leads to ideas like survival of the fittest and a holism perspective maybe looks at our universe more as fractal or hologram oriented where each individualized piece is somehow a reflection of the whole <clears throat> and that that certainly lines up with my perspective like i it doesn't make like dualism doesn't make logical sense to me that there is a um you know that there's separateness that there's like a totality and you or me as individuals are um intrinsically apart from from um from the totality um and I often explain it through this like inner world, outer world language that we have an inner world, we have an outer world, and there's a connection between the two. And our life, our life experiences are a, um, our life experiences are more or less a loom between, are woven on the loom that is made up from the inner world and the outer world and our life experiences are ultimately crafted upon two things where we put our attention on in the outer world and then how we define what we're putting our attention on in the inner world and that creates the 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 texture of our experiences and then one of the things we also see in this in this uh, realm where we're having life is that there is um, there's resonance where um, things that are of similar nature and we could even bring that down to frequency because frequency best split is 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 the most objective way I think of understanding it like frequency of like musical notes and so forth that things that are in resonance mathematical fra factors factors yeah fractions factors factors of each other like there's a resonance and there's a similarity even though that the expression may be slightly different when there is a resonance that energy flows between these two things this is part of the nature of our reality all right so where am i going with all this all right all right um so this presentation let me pause for a moment this presentation about the this this eclipse experience and what's going on in reality has to do with um you know with with holism and resonance and so forth and that's what i'm going to move into but the truth of the matter is i'm going i've pulled these slides together but i'm not certain where i'm going to go with this presentation so it's going to be unfolding as we as we are um, going through these slides and to me that keeps it more real more authentic but then from a i guess a viewer's perspective that can you know maybe sometimes it shows itself in a little bit of rambling but you know that's part of the process which we do in order to make these omelets these mental omelets so all right dualism holism fractal inner world outer world another way of looking at that is as above so below this is another way which the holism has been expressed through the ages and so as above so below the brain as a model of the universe so the universe is like a giant human brain scientist fine once again structural parameters have identified unexpected agreement levels Did I? the connectivity within the two networks evolve prob probably the connectivity within the two networks evolves following similar physical principles despite the striking and obvious difference between the physical powers regulating galaxies and neurons. I'm looking at that right now and I'm wondering if something was cut out when I did that screenshot. Probably so. But basically what, what I'm pointing out is that we're seeing this idea is being introduced um, within 
mainstream thinking of the human brain is a model of the universe, which is really just like this holism, fractal understanding of experiential reality and what we think of as whatever the brain is, because the brain isn't the mind, but it certainly has influences on our cognitive function because you get jacked up in the head like it jacks up your cognitive functions. Um, they're saying that the universe, the physical universe, what we call outer space, is in a similar type of model um, supporting this whole idea of, as I said, like fractals and, and as above, so below, um, holism, so forth. And... All right, so this is where we're going with it. This is what we're talking about with with this comet, with this eclipse. Like, what's going on? Because there's so much, there's so much kind of like, there's change happening in our experiential reality. What we think of as the paradigm, it's changing more and more fast, more and more quickly um, through technology, through like you know, what's normal and what's not normal, and they're changing that and. The fact that it changes is more of a reflection of the plasticity of our experience. Like it can change and it changes based upon what, um, what, uh, it changes, it can change based upon like the paradigm. The paradigm can change it. And as the participants of the paradigm, you, me, and all the other players in this experience their willingness to go along with the pied piper with the cha with the person who's causing the change whatever and whomever that is you know i don't know um it can change all of reality changes and very very quickly <coughs> um on the side note of this like like i think about this uh there was once upon a time i used to smoke a lot of cannabis i i don't smoke cannabis often anymore um but I can remember when I used to smoke cannabis, it was when cannabis was illegal. I mean, this was like five or six years ago. And I can remember there being like an element of, you know, just awareness or maybe anxiety if I would smoke. I used to live in an apartment in, in Marietta. And I was across the street from the police station and I would smoke cannabis there. Uh, Marietta, Pennsylvania, and I'd smoke cannabis in my apartment. And cannabis has a pungent aroma. And it's commonplace nowadays, but once upon a time when cannabis was illegal, um, like that, that aroma, like it was undeniable and there could be all sorts of like, like real legal ramifications. Like, you know, people would go to be locked up and put into prisons based upon, upon, um, smoking it and there was a large percentage of the population that they would smell that and they would get angry and like how dare you in prison and bad behavior and then like you know medical marijuana came they changed the context of what cannabis is and now like you know your grandmother goes to a drive through and she buys cannabis I don't smoke it anymore because <laughs> for a variety of reasons but um, the point I'm trying to make is like values and the way people live can change on a dime. And that's just a simplistic example of how things change. And so things are changing. Where am I going with all this? And our life is changing rapidly. And the experience is changing rapidly. And it's very much being driven by, by technology. And we think of like the World Economic Forum and Bill Gates and vaccines and all of that. But, you know, it's... It's changing and it's weird and who's changing it we don't really know because it's a mystery we don't really have the big picture as to what's going on but we can get some sort of agreement and insight that the the nature of the of where we're having this game like experience is changing so all right let's go back to surrealism we're gonna introduce surrealism um, I became interested in surrealism, particularly right now, as we saw that, that the boat that brought down the bridge was called Dolly, named after Salvador Dolly, and Dolly is the, Salvador Dolly is the, you know, the, the best known example or the face of the surrealism movement. And, from a general perspective, like I was aware of surrealism, I was aware that it was like an artistic movement, um, 
in the primarily um, focused in the the first half of the 20th century and and you know I I was aware of it from that perspective but once I saw dot like the role of Dolly in this whole sort of like strange synchromistic um, collapse of the Baltimore Bridge and its correspondence with the with the um, with with the eclipse like I, I became more curious about sur- surrealism and I'm reading about it and I'm realizing that surrealism is what we're calling synchromysticism um, so let me let's go into that a, a little bit so surrealism is an art and cultural movement like I was thinking about it just purely as an art movement but it was a cultural movement and, and granted this is like this is like Wikipedia definition so <coughs> By no means am I suggesting that this is all there is to it. I'm just saying that, you know, this is a a, <clears throat> a point of reference to begin to to expand our our understanding. So, surrealism is a cultural movement developed in Europe aftermath of World War One, in which artists aim to allow the unconscious mind to express itself often resulting in the depiction of illogical or dreamlike scenes and ideas. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, according to the leader of surrealism, that's a funny word to use, leader, but it says surrealism, uh, the intention was to resolve the previously contradictory conditions of dream and reality into an absolute reality a super reality or surreality that's what i guess surrealism is is like it's a super reality <clears throat> and then so its intention was to really tap into this super reality this uh when, and i'm going to define super reality not as in like superman but but like a greater reality and it produced works of painting writing theater filmmaking and photography as well as other media so let's go look at this um, besides the use of dream analysis, they emphasize that one could combine inside the same inside the same frame elements not normally found together to produce illogical and startling effects. Breton, Andre Breton, I guess that's how I pronounce his name, included the idea of startling juxtapositions in his 1924 manifesto, taking it in turn from a 1918 essay by poet Pierre. Reverdi, which said a juxtaposition of two or more less distant realities. Um, the more the relationship between the two juxtaposed realities is distant and true, the stronger the image will be, the greater its emotional power and poetic reality. That's synchromysticism, my friends. When we take these two ideas which should not be connected and we're seeing how they're connected, um, the fact that the key bridge corresponds with Chiron, you know, the key and bridge ponds, ponds 12 comet, like, and we see that connection. That's surrealism. And the fact that Dali, Dali is the, is the link between the two, the symbol of surrealism is like, we could see all these elements are in play. The group, so the group being the, the surrealists, aim to revolutionize the human experience. That's what we're talking about. If you're interested in these ideas and this way of thought during this time of immense change, is we're, we're interested in changing the human experience. So the, the surrealists wanted to free people from false rationality, I'd say false reality, and restrictive customs and structures. Breton proclaimed that the true aim of surrealism was long live the social revolution and it alone. The purpose of surrealism, of tapping into super reality, was to change the human experience. My friends, if there's not a truth between what, what, between that and what synchromysticism is, like, you know, I don't know then 
If you don't see that truth, then I think you're missing the point of what all of these videos are about. We're exploring the nature of reality to break out of the false reality. And the fact that Dali is coming into this experience, whatever this experience is, whether we're living a dream, whether we're living in a, a simulator, I don't know. But the surrealists of the first half of the century are communicating to us today. We are the surrealists in this modern moment or this contemporary moment, or they are us, or there's a communication. Like, however you want to go and make that connection, that connection is undoubtedly happening. And even more interesting is remember, like, they called it surrealism, we're calling it synchromysticism. The idea, synchro mysticism comes from synchronicity and synchronicity was introduced to us by what Carl Jung in the 1950s. They did not have that language. Um, we're dealing with the same thing. In fact, I would say that they're, we're, we're communicating with each other. We've made a loop. We've made a loop. Um, Here's a quote from Salvador Dali. Surrealism is destructive, but it destroys only what it considers to be the, sh the shackles limiting our vision. What's our vision? Uh, maybe linear time? The, uh, maybe our vision is the fact that whoever, whatever, this surrealist in, surrealism movement, by thinking of surrealism as an art movement is limiting. Surrealism was an approach to understanding reality. That's bleeding through to where we are right now. Um, Salvador, um, a Salvador Dali painting looks oddly similar to the Dali caused key bridge collapse. So we're dealing with, um, we're dealing with, with this as well. So what do we got right here? April 4th from Baltimore. This is a Salvador Dali painting. Um, in the last video, I brought up the some of his paintings, his most famous works of the melting clocks. Here we see there was this, this painting which he made of this dream bridge, which looks like the key bridge right here in an odd way. Um, there's a strange link. There's a strange link. The brain is the model of the universe, right? You know, dualism, holism, surrealism. What is happening here? Okay. Here's the dolly. We looked at this. Here's the boat. Here we have it right here. We keep on going. So this is interesting. So here's a video I recorded when I was in Baltimore. So there's a bleed through which... Susquehanna mystery, which, which Susquehanna alchemy, which, you know, my Quan connects to this. So I made this video with Ross Ben. Like I, I included before any of this falling of the bridge of my connection with Ross Ben, um, in Chestnut Hill. We met face to face also on 323.22 in Baltimore. And we made this episode from the 40th parallel episode 14 ball team more mysteries all right we have that uh you could see this right here um here's a screenshot from that and we recorded it on march 23rd uh 2022 um which is awfully interesting because on baltimore on march 23rd 77 march 23rd 22 22 77 77 was when the key bridge opened, you know, whatever that is, whatever these time date stamps are, we, we're, we're just looking at these, these connections, these bleed throughs, these synchromistic connections. And what I've been talking about really through all of calendar year 2024 is this cup coming 2024 River and Stars Tour Cosmic Geomancy Ceremony date with the first one being the kickoff of April 8th on the Susquehanna River in Sunbury. And then I show these other ones we're going to have in, um, uh, along the Susquehanna River on May Day and then in Berkeley Springs on the Potomac River on the summer solstice and then Occoquan and then Norfolk. All of these are on different parts of the Susquehanna River 
or tributaries of the Susquehanna River or the tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay, which we recognize is also the Susquehanna River. That's all part of this, this River and Stars geomancy, cosmic geomancy tour, which we've been talking about since the beginning of 2024. And then when we go and we look at Baltimore and the collapse of the Key Bridge, this is where the Key Bridge, the Key Bridge is right here. This is the Patapsco River and the Patapsco River the Key Bridge crosses the Patapsco River in what becomes the Baltimore Inner Harbor. And then that goes into the Chesapeake Bay. Right here is the Chesapeake Bay. That's right here. This spot right here is fits in with all of these red dots or these red stars. These red stars are where the... Um, the locations of this river and stars geomancy tours are going to be like i made this slide i made this slide in in february i believe and we could see baltimore is right here it's all along the same waterway there's a strange strange interconnection um here we have baltimore this is the susquehanna river this is where the susquehanna river transitions to the chesapeake bay here's the chesapeake bay this is the key bridge like there is a connection. There's a strange surrealism, Salvador Dali surreal, synchromistic connection between this bridge collapse. I mean, also interesting. So I made this presentation. This was the format or the platform which I use to create these slide presentations, which you see right now. So I just use Keynote. Keynote is a comes with Apple computers, and I made this Crimea to St. Pete presentation March 16th, 2022. So I made this presentation a, a week before me and Ross Ben made this recording. I never presented this, but it was from Crimea to St. Pete. And it was basically talking about how Baltimore, where I was staying in Baltimore, corresponds with Crimea, uh, which is an island, or no, it's a peninsula, uh, in the Ukraine and how I was living in Baltimore right when this Ukraine thing kicked off and then I went to St. Petersburg, Florida and St. Petersburg, Russia and just all these correspondences. Here's a screenshot from that presentation which I never presented but I still saved it. It says Crimean St. Pete right here and in that I did this map and here is a line from Baltimore, and it goes all the way down here. This is like the, the expanded version of what this is, because this is Tampa Bay, and there's St. Petersburg. And so I made a connection. I made a connection in time and space in this map of like a line between Baltimore and um, St. Petersburg. And the reason why that's interesting is because the Baltimore Bridge Collapse rekindles Skyway memories for Tampa Bay area residents. The Baltimore Bridge Collapse brings back memories of the 1980 Skyway Bridge Collapse in Tampa. These are historic photos of the Skyway Bridge Collapse. Like, look right here. This is a, this, this cargo boat hit this bridge, which goes over the Tampa Bay and caused this collapse. This looks like a friggin' movie poster. I don't buy that for a second. But look right here. This is, this is the close up of this, of this connection I made, uh, for the Crimea St. Petersburg presentation, um, made in March 2022. And we could see it connects. This right here, this, this is that bridge. This bridge right here is this. And I am showing a connection between this area and Baltimore strange bleed through what i'm what am i pointing out i'm pointing out like there's a strange bizarre synchro mystic surrealistic connection going on between oh and here's the craziest freaking thing here's the craziest fucking thing i don't even have this um uh i don't even have this in the um let me pull this up right here uh da, 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 da. uh dolly Look where the Salvador Dali Museum is. Do you see where the Salvador Dali Museum is? It's in St. Petersburg, Florida. Like, I'm doing this in real time for you guys right now. Um, there's something really, really odd being 
that that's bleeding through this surrealism, this surrealism, synchro mysticism, Salvador Dali, uh, Baltimore, Tampa Bay, comets, all this sort of stuff. But remember, it's a mystery. We're not defining any of it. I don't know. We're just in it. We're witnessing it. And we're seeing something very, very magical unfolding before our eyes. We've got enough clues that we can look back at what has been laid out behind us and we can see that there is an intelligence that seems to be involved with this. All right. 30 minutes in. All right. So let's go here. So this is what we talked about before. We've got the eclipse cycle, solar eclipse, 4 8. That's tomorrow. We had the lunar eclipse, 3 28. Solar eclipse in sidereal takes place 24 degrees Pisces. The sun, the moon, and Chiron are conjunct. 9 degrees Pisces is where the lunar eclipse took place. 9 degrees Pisces and 9 degrees Virgo because that was a full moon. The day after this eclipse, the key bridge. Um, collapses in Baltimore by Dolly. Um, and then at the eclipse, we're going to see comet um, Pons Brooks visible in the sky. All right. This is what's going to look like at the moment of the eclipse. Um, these are all the planets. This is where the comet is. Here's another artistic representation of what the sky looks like. There's Mars, Saturn, Neptune, Venus. There's the eclipse. Mercury will be right there. The comet will be right here, and here's Jupiter and Uranus. We could see the same thing is being presented right here. We're looking at the same imagery. Remember this, Chiron's symbol is the key. Pons means bridge. Key bridge, you know, the bridge collapsed on, um, you know, the, the day after the lunar eclipse. We've, we've covered that. So where are we going with this? All right, comets in the electric universe. <clears throat> According to the electric universe model, comets are not inert ba balls of ice and rocky dust particles aggregated into a dirty ice ball as the standard comet theory holds. Instead, they're solid asteroid-like rocks containing little ice. They're negatively charged with electricity. Their motion through... Their motion through the positively charged solar wind triggers electrical discharges. Um, so comets play like a role within electrical universe, you know, whatever the universe is. Um, and we're looking right here. You see the brain's activity. Here are the neurons and the electrical movement. Here's your electrical universe, right? Brain is the model of the universe, as above, so below. It's all a mystery. Inner world, outer world. Um, what you're looking at, how you define it. So we see that going on. We see that going on very clearly with the people who are looking at this comet, and they're looking at it through a biblical lens. Uh, their lens, their internal world is understood biblically, so they are going to see, um, and the universe reflects this back to them. This seemingly is how the world all works, is in their language set, which is, you know, very biblical. We'll see if, you know, if what happens. Anyway, where are we going with this? Duh, 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 duh. All right. So, 1812, the comet was discovered by this guy, Jean-Louis Jean Pons. I wonder if I'm saying, saying that correct. Um, and then, <clears throat> this guy, Enki, isn't Enki like one of the Sumerian gods? Yeah. He determined the definitive orbit of the comet that was discovered in 1812 to be 70.68 years. How he did that, I don't know. This puts it, you know, on a similar, on a similar time scale as the precession of the equinoxes. The precession of the equinoxes say that the, um, the turning of the sky, the wobble of the earth moves one degree every 72 years. You know, we talked about that. But anyway, it says the orbit was used to generate an ephemeris for the 1883-84 return. So it was said April, September 83, um, the comet was seen again by this guy, William Robert Brooks. I believe he was in um, New York State when it happened, when he discovered it. But they, that's why it's called the Pons Brooks Comet, because they're saying it's the same comet. Um, it was later identified with 1812. So where are we going with this? Uh, so we know that's where the name Pons comes from. So Pons is this guy, uh, Pons first discovered it. 
And Pons is, uh, he went on to become the greatest visual comet discoverer of all times. He discovered 37 different comets. Now look at this picture of him. No one really look like that. looks like that. I don't know. Um, so, but that's not the only meaning of pawns. Um, the role of the pawns, uh, pawns is in your brain. Um, the oldest layer of the brain, the reptilian brain, as they call it in the triune, triune brain model, is composed of the brain stem. So the brain stem is the medulla, the pons, the cerebellum, the midbrain, and so forth. Um, the pons transmits signals between your forebrain and your cerebellum. So it's a bridge. It is where, um, it is where electrical signals, electrical signals are communicated. The pons, the, the comets, this guy named Pons, uh, is able to identify all these comets, which are triggering electrical discharges between outer space where, <laughs> right, where they tell us now that, that the, um, that the brain and the, the brain in your head and the, the, the universe which we're living in, they're the same model. They're fractals of one another. And now we know the guy Pons who discovers, um, all of these comets also named Pons is the part of the brain where, um, electrical signals or comets in the brain are, are, are happening. Like this is occurring. All right. So, <clears throat> tomorrow, tomorrow is this, the eclipse, and we're going to be at Sunbury, Pennsylvania. That's where it's going to take place. And this is where it takes, uh, Sunbury is right here. This is the west branch. This is the north branch. This is the lower branch. That's Sunbury right here. There's Sunbury. And, um... Uh, Sunbury is the first building to be lit with Thomas Edison's three wire system. So it's interesting because here's the three wires. We got Edison right there. It's electricity. This is a major place in, in the history of electricity. Sunbury, the original, um, Edison electrical plant, 1883, the original Sunbury plant, the world's first three wire electrical plant, um, designed and built by Edison. So, there has been other distribution of electricity uh, prior to this, but this is the first time they use a positive, negative, and a ground, uh, which is the standard way of distributing electricity uh, nowadays in the world. And this first happened in Sunbury. We've got this, the first electrification project of Thomas Edison, Sunbury, and so forth. Um, so this is where we are do, are going to be for the eclipse. We're going to be there because Sunbury means eclipse because that's when the sun is buried during an eclipse. So I also want to add this because this is strange. So from 1727 to 1767, Sunbury was the largest and most influential Indian settlements in Pennsylvania. At the time, it was known as Shemokin, not to be confused with the present day city of Shemokin. So this is the present city, the present day city known as Shemokin, and this is Sunbury. This was once known as Shemokin. They decided to name it Sunbury, but it was called Shemokin, and then they said, hey, well, let's go call this city right here, 16 miles away, Shemokin. For whatever reason, they did that. Um, seemingly very, very um, interestingly and confusing. So let's go back to the history of the, um, the, the first connection of electricity in Sunbury. Shemokin, however, would not be the world's first town illuminated with by a first three-wire electric station with overhead conductors. So they're talking about this, the, the, the modern town Shemokin. Soon after his arrival in Shemokin, Edison also licensed an electric company with investors in Sunbury, some 16 miles to the southeast. Uh, that's backwards because they're saying that Edison first arrived right here in Shemokin and then he, he, he met with some investors here. And they said that Shemokin is to the southeast of Sunbury. Sunbury is not to the southeast of Shemokin. Um, using Sunbury's city hotel as its base, the Sunbury company built a coal-fired power plant on a vacant lot in the corner of Vine and 4th Street just three in three weeks after a three-wire line was strung to the city 
Hotel, Edison, on the night of July 4th, switched on a current to a 100-candle power light over the city hotel entrance, uh, entrance to the cheers of the residents and marches played by local bands. So this happened on July 4th, 1883. This is the first time that a um, three-wire electrical light station with overhead conductors was used to distribute electricity, and it happened in Sunbury. And then we see on September 22nd, so this is a handful of months later, Edison was back in Shemokin. So this is back in this town of Shemokin. So the electrical distribution happened here, three wires, or these three wires, uh, on the 4th of July, and then right here. The 4th of July is interesting because that's when the Earth is said to be closest to the sun. Now Edison is back at Shemokin, and while he's there, um, Edison was back in Shemokin where a large crowd followed him to the home of Cat McCowell, an enthusiastic supporter and investor in the company who had consented to have the kitchen in her mansion at East Independence Street. So now again, we've got another one of these 4th of July connections, 4th of July and now Independence Street. Fearful for the safety of, um, for her, of her, uh, of safety and kitty so that's Catherine um, only permitted the wiring of the kitchen and insisted that the wire run on the surface of the wall and then um, the the crowd followed Edison a few blocks to the corner of Rock and Sunbury Street so Sunbury is connected Rock is connected this is all so synchromistic where they watch the lights go on and um, the building in a building that was owned by the Illumination Company so this is um, by William Dowdy. They then walked to their third and final stop, the St. Edward's Catholic Church on Shemokin Street, which that night became the first church in the world to be lighted by electricity. So what they're saying is, all right, so on September 22nd in Shemokin, uh, that this gets lit up. Um, and not only that, a church is lit up. So first this is lit up by three wire, and then on July 4th, and then all the same names, like we've got, this is 4th of July, this was one Shemokin, and then this is now Sunbury. So now we have on September 22nd in Shemokin, on Sunbury Street, uh, we, we've got um, an independent street. No, the Sunbury Street is, is right here, um, is where this St. Edward's Catholic Church, they light up again. Why is that interesting? Because on September 1883, William Brooks um, identifies this Pond's Comet, and then an outburst was observed in the comet on September 21st through 22nd, the same time that this uh, electricity happened in Shemokin and Sunbury. The comet became um, brightened from a magnitude of 10 down um, to, to an 8. So the smaller the number, the brighter that magnitude and its appearance change. So we've got this like history of like this comet, whatever the hell it is, which is then seen in the sky, like it changes form at the same time, like all of this Sunbury stuff happens. So we're going to be back here in Sunbury um, at the same time that it, the comet was visible, supposedly, whatever all of this stuff is, right, that it was visible before in 1883, we're going to be here in 2024 doing our River and Stars ceremony after all this weird Baltimore stuff. All right, we're going to keep going with this. Brain is the model, right? All right, ponds right here. We talked about that. Um all right, this is also interesting. So how do brains work? The brain does indeed convey symbols by means of electricity and chemical compounds. Sunbury has a strong connection to electricity, but it also has a strong connection to, um, uh, to chemical distribution. Um, and we also want to keep in mind, where do we have right here? The American Chemical Society. Uh, Joseph Priestley, or this sign is located in, um, uh, it is found in, um, uh, right here at the Joseph Priestley house. This is Sunbury. This is where we're holding the, um, these three spots are where we're going to be right here, right here, and right here for the 
Eclipse River and Star ceremony. And right here is the Joseph Priestley House. And there, uh, on August 1st, 1874, chemists from 15 states, the District of Columbia and Canada met here to celebrate the centennial of the discovery of oxygen by Priestley. And discussions at the meeting um, that led to the founding of the American Chemical Society. In tribute to his scientific contributions and in gratitude to the recognition of the inspiration he provided for the establishment, the American Chemical Society dedicates this plaque in the memory of Joseph Priestley, right here. Why is that? Because Joseph Priestley is said to be the father of chemistry. He's the guy who discovered oxygen. He discovered his, the discovery of oxygen moved from um, uh, a scientific approach of looking at alchemy and they moved it to chemistry. And the guy who did it, Joseph Priestley, he used to live in England, but then he moved over to here to this part of the new world. And he lived at the Joseph Priestley house, which is right across the street from Sunbury. So we've got right here in Sunbury is where Edison built his first electrical um, distribution plant. And then right here is where the father of chemistry went and connected. We've also got, we've got all of these connections right here on the Primordial River at the Primordial Confluence. All this stuff is going on right here. All right. What's going on? What's going on, my friends? So, uh... Do I even want to bring this into it? So the triune brain. Um, we talked about pons as being the reptilian brain. Um, the other, the reptilian brain as a concept comes, uh, fits into something which is called the triune brain model of understanding the brain. So these are all just models. Like all these models are just abstract ideas of trying to understand the nature of reality. So never, never confuse the map with the territory. Never confuse the model with reality. This is just a model. But in this model, we get the idea that the bond, the pons as part of the brain is relays to the reptilian brain. And then that also implies the other parts, which are the mammalian brain and the human brain. The other part of our, um, our eclipse story is the fact that not only is Pons going to be there, but Chiron is going to be conjunct the moon and the sun. Chiron isn't limited, is it not dis, um, displayed on this model? And Chiron is so important because Chiron is, um, Chiron is the key, right? Chiron is the key. And we've got the key bridge, which collapsed. We've got like Pons, which is bridge. We've got Chiron, which is the key. And we've got Chi the key bridge, which was hit by Dolly. And this crazy ass sort of like um, synchro mystic, surreal, like true story unfolding before our eyes. And like, you know, the bridge is collapsing, the collapse, like the, all of the stuff is, is, is falling down, but in front of us, the, the seemingly separateness, the bridge between like the, the big brain and the little brain, if you will. So anyway, so Chiron, the story of Chiron is, um, here we go. Chiron, um, is, uh, is a creature in Greek mythology. So Chiron is a centaur because Chiron was the wisest and just of all centaurs. And a centaur is a creature whose upper body is human and lower body is horse, right? What do we have here? We've got the mammalian and we've got the human brain. This is, these are the three parts of the triune brain. We've got pons and then these two are Chiron, the horse part and the, um, and then the, the human part. All of these elements are so strongly, um, are so strongly in play right now. So how, wh what are we going to do with this? How are we going to take this? Like, where are we going to go with this? Um, what is the deeper meaning of surrealism? Surrealism aims to revolutionize the human experience. Right now, our human experience is changing. It is being, it is being, um, shoehorned into an experience which is grounded by technology. You know, our conversation, me and you are, ha are conversing right now through technology. The reason why we want you to come out to the, to, to the River and Stars ceremony is so that we cannot get shoehorned into it. 
What we want to do is learn from technology so we can move all away from that to have a different a revolutionized human experience, balancing the rational visions of life with the power of the unconscious and dreams. Okay? So the bridge comes down. What does that mean? Do bridges connect or separate us? By definition, the function of a bridge, uh, a bridge philosophers demonstrate by debating, by debating the function of a bridge, philosophers demonstrate the benefits of recognizing differences. Do bridges connect or separate, separate us? It means the two banks are most distinguished from each other by the connection between them. The bridge can also connect two separate spaces without unifying. Generator of differences. On his part, French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, I don't know if I pronounced that right, sees the bridge as the generator of differences by the means by which two different things connect, but it is also the way by which two connected things can most clearly express their differences. To cross a bridge is to cross boundaries, to leave the familiar intimate space where one is in his or her own place in order to enter a different horizon, a strange unknown space where, there, where one is exposed to others and uncovered without being in his or her, his or her, his or her own unique special space. The sense of the polarity of human space made up of the reassuring stable <clears throat> inside and the uncertain dynamic outside was expressed by the ancient Greeks as a pair of united yet opposing deities. All right, am I going to keep reading all that? All right, so I'm just going to go and bring this back to where we began. The collapse of the bridge. The bridge is both the symbol of unification, but then also the indication of how things are separate. Dualism and holism. We're looking at the same thing. We're looking at this story being reflected back in to our eyes in a synchromistic, surreal, um, surrealism, uh, undeniable linkage of, of events. And so, my friends, it is here, like in this just like all over the place sort of tour de force, you know, force because I forced this tour, like it didn't feel an eloquent, eloquently described, but I want to get this out there, this like these, these, these touch points into the mind space before this eclipse, whatever the hell an eclipse is, before this hits, um, so we can see like there, there, there's, there's something, there's something super reality being reflected back to us in this really, really funny, interesting sort of way. It's a mystery. I don't know what it is, but if you're watching this video, we're sharing this together. We're surrealists. We're synchro mystics. We are watching the bridges of separation, separation from ourselves, separation from the totality of whatever this mystery is, collapse before us. And so we're sharing this journey together. Um, if you have time, come out. You see this video beforehand, come out and join us. Um, if not, come out and join us for one of the other synchromistic River and Stars Cosmic Gateway experiences as we move forward. <laughs> into the un into the unknown take care my friend